I wanted to be a millionaire who has a girlfriend because I thought that would make me happy. Until he became one and realized all bullshit. I'm super excited to welcome Stephen Bartlett on today's Meet Your Mentor show, who will teach you that everything you thought of success is actually not true. Stephen has already had more success in his young life than many of us can barely dream of. From a bedroom in Manchester, when he was just 22 years old, Stephen started one of the world's leading social media companies and has grown to a team of more than 700 people today. Stephen has won several awards like the Great British Entrepreneur of the Year, is hosting the top charting podcast The Diary of a CEO and was already speaking at the United Nations or alongside Barack Obama. But in a world where we are told that we must sacrifice to become successful, Stephen borrows from his own inspiring success story and teaches us how we can attain long-lasting fulfillment in our modern, hyper-connected landscape. Stephen, I'm so happy to have you on the show. So, first of all, thank you so much that you are joining our little podcast. And whenever I go through your social media, I realize you're 27 years old, you're about to publish your book, and your Instagram feed is full of deep wisdom. My first question to you is, where do you seek all this inspiration from? It's amazing. Do you know, I think um, I get asked that question a lot. And if I'm honest, um, most of the things that I share in terms of ideas or... Um, wisdom as you say just comes from self-analysis and really like I think I'm incredibly uh, critical or analytical as it relates to my own experience but also the experience of others so I think a lot of the time people go through life and they have certain things happen to them and they feel certain things and they think certain things but I don't think they spend enough time trying to understand um, or trying trying to draw solid conclusions from some of those experiences Whereas I think everything that happens to me, I'm, I'm always looking for the conclusion or looking for the insight or looking for the, the, um, the, the underlying, you know, consistent and um, undeniable truth, I guess, in, in everything. So, you know, because it's, it's, it appears to me that we all experience the same thing, but just in different ways and like in different expressions. So we all go through rejection and we all go through you know, um, heartbreak and we all you know, have the same, typically the same issues. And I think a lot of the time you can fall into the trap of thinking that these uh, issues or the problems or the challenges you have are unique to yourself. But when you speak to somebody and you, you find out that everybody has gone through the same things and this is an, an inherent part of the human condition, but also an inherent part of like living in life, I think it's quite um, liberating. And so not only do I, I find it liberating to write things in a way that is relatable to people so that they know that they're not the only ones going through something, sure. but I also find it as a great way to learn and to, to learn from your past and to therefore be better in the future. So that's really, I guess, my two central objectives, which is to make sure people know that their experiences aren't unique to them and then to, to give them something where they can... Um, they can make their future better than their past. So, yeah. So by saying self-reflection, does it also mean you write everything down or do you journal or is there any tool that helps you? There's a couple of tools. The first is my own brain, which means like genuinely just thinking and like making time to think about my thoughts. And a lot of people don't spend enough time thinking about their thoughts. They just think. And when you think, it's almost like you're on a roller coaster. You're completely... Um, powerless to where your mind and your thoughts might take you. And then you have another group of people who I think are considered to be wise. And they're only, the only reason they're considered to be wise is because they spend a lot of time thinking about their thinking. Um, so this can sometimes just be on my own. It can be just pondering um, and, and, and trying to, trying to uh, think in, in more effective ways. And then the other way is like, yeah, writing really helps me. Um, I'm fortunate because I have an audience. So I have to write every day and this is non-negotiable. Two times a day I have to post on my Instagram. So I have to think of something to say. And that's not me just like coming up with a, you know, a whatever, whatever, or someone doing it for me. That's me thinking of something to say. So because I know I have to write every single, because I know I have to post to the world every day, my notes are full of just, my notes are full of just ideas, which means that when an experience happens to me, I don't let it go. I don't let it just come over me and go past me. I grab onto it. I crack it open and look inside of it. And I put the conclusion of whatever I found inside that experience in my notes. And then I deliver it to the world at 7 p.m. every day on my Instagram. And wow, that's on my amazing. Other channels. 
And also I have a podcast. My podcast is weekly. So that, that requires me to write about 12 pages of thoughts. Um, and, and this is, again, it's made me, it's funny because in giving to the world and like producing this content for other people, um, it's given me more than, than, than I've given to anybody else. And I know that, I know that for sure. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, I think a crucial part in this whole self-reflection game is also that we choose mentors in our lives. And I'm sure that, you, that maybe you have one or some actually in your life as well. And I'm asking you, which impact did they have? And is there any advice you can also share? Yeah, I think I, think I just have so many mentors in so many different forms. And, you know, mentors can be both Uh, good mentors and you know when I say that I mean mentors that have taught you positive lessons but equally valuable can be some of your mentors that taught you bad things or like you know, what not to do through their own bad example and I kind of value both in equal measure some of the, the best lessons I've learned haven't come from um, advice or insights it's from watching someone make serious mistakes and trying and being able to understand their mistake objectively without being in the heart of you know being in, in the eye of the storm and um outside of that like when people think of mentors they think you have one person or two people that stand beside you telling you what to do my mentors are like because of the nature of the internet and the fact that we can access the combined knowledge of the you know the the, the world and the, the world from a historical standpoint, instantaneously, just by searching anything, your mentors are now all dig, uh, digital mentors. And like, I can tap into the mind and thoughts of Elon Musk and watch him talk for hours and hours and hours and watch his Twitter feed and watch him argue with someone else and compare ideas. And, and, and these are like, this is a luxury that nobody's ever had in the history of the world. The ability to chime in on the conversations of the most intelligent people of all time. So my mentors, if I was to say I had mentors, I'd really think my mentors were, were people that I follow online and um, their, their writings and their books and, and those kinds of things. Those are the, the mentors that have had the biggest impact on my thinking in my life. Um, so that basically and, means everybody of us, if famous or not, has the amazing access to the greatest mentors of all times, right? Because information of course, if you have access to the internet, and I think that's an important like, it's an important thing to say because a lot of the world doesn't have access to the internet. And if you have access to the internet, you have access to the to more information than we've ever had access to before. And there can really be no excuse as to why you don't understand yeah. or know something or you know why you, for the gaps in your own knowledge that are causing you problems so yeah it's a unique time and I, um, it's a, only a time that's been you know, if we think about when the internet was established it's what maybe 20 30 years old in terms of when it really took off so it's a unique time absolutely is there any advice you can give on success it means like is there any new definition i mean you your book is called happy sex millionaire What is actually a happy, sexy millionaire in your definition? I mean, so the, the book is called Happy, Sexy Millionaire because when I was 18 and I was clearly insecure and had, you know, and felt like I wasn't enough and was seeking external validation, I wrote in my diary that I wanted to be a sexy millionaire before I was 25 years old. Like it says, I wanted a Range Rover Sport to be my first car. I wanted to be a millionaire before I was 25. Um, I wanted a girlfriend, um, which is, uh, which is part of the sexy element. I wanted a girlfriend, a long-term relationship. And the last one was I wanted to work on my body image and everybody's seen this diary because it's all over the internet now, but that's what I wrote in my diary. I wanted to be a sexy millionaire who had a girlfriend because I thought that would make me happy. And, um, upon getting a Range Rover Sport, which was my first car and becoming a millionaire before I was 25 and getting a long-term girlfriend, I realized that, um, those, none of those things made you happy. So, um, or at least happier like those things aren't in, an intrinsic part of happiness so um that's why the book has that title but to answer your first question about the definition of success it's a really like it's a really subjective one in many ways but ultimately success should be like aiming towards the same fundamental goal which is happiness and if anyone if you ask someone what their goal is or what success is it has sorry if you ask anyone what their yeah their goals in life are or their or what they think success means to them. And if they don't say happiness, if that isn't the North Star, if that isn't the ultimate aim, then I, then I, I think they are, um, I think they're in danger of, um, of following paths that lead to nowhere. So um, 
I guess everyone's definition of success should be happiness, but how you achieve happiness um, is a, is a individual experience. And like in, in uh, modern, in the modern world and in pop culture and on Instagram, success means, you know, fame, money, um, good looks and achievement, but achievement isn't the, the only factor of, 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 of happiness. Yeah. Um, so achievement is just one element of being, of being happy. Um, what means so happiness for you now after experiencing and actually achieving so many things people are dreaming of their whole life? I mean, what is... A lot of it comes down to now? balance, which means, don't, you know, I realize that achievement is a fundamental part of success. Oh, sorry, I realize that achievement is a fundamental part of happiness. And this is why it talks a lot about this in my book. But you can sacrifice all of the other things like human connection and love and relationships at the expense of, you know, being more successful. And I think that's probably what I, what I did in order to become successful. Um, and now like the real, my real aim is achieving a nice sense of harmony and balance in my life, which means investing enough time in myself and my relationships and um, philanthropic endeavors, as well as my career and my, my ambitions and, and the things that stimulate me in that way. And it's really about balance. And if you ever find your life is out of whack or your life is too tilted in one direction, then again, you're, on a, you're running a dangerous course because you typically don't tend to find out that your life was out of balance until it's too late. And so you get people having midlife crises or you have people falling into depression because their life wasn't balanced properly or they were prioritizing the wrong thing. So right now that's my focus, balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing. However, I think it's sometimes very difficult to keep up the balance because we are so distracted and we're not focusing. How do you maintain a routine and how do you make sure that it's really a balance? Because I can imagine that you have a very busy life as well. I mean, you're a CEO, you're like publishing a lot. How do you keep your balance? If you're clear on, if you're clear on what your North Star is, and when I say North Star, I mean the The, the highest of your goals, the most fundamental objective you have. If you're clear on what that is and you're, you're clear that that is to be happy and then you just go one level below it and say, okay, in order to be happy, what does my, my life need to be full of? And you say, well, I need a, I need a, a partner. I want to be, you know, I want to be in love. I need, to, I want to be in, in loving uh, family relationships and platonic relationships. And um, I, I need um, financial freedom and all of these things. And I need my health And then you go a step below it and it, 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 the step below it is, okay, so how do I get those things? If you, if you have that North Star, which then creates these pillars below it, it's very easy to understand like what decisions on a daily basis are to be prioritized and which ones aren't. And it all comes from having, having real clarity on my North Star, which is what I want my, my life to be like in order to make me happy, which is my ultimate goal. And, um, And I'm just clear on that. It's so, you know, you can do exercises if you want. You can make a, a mood board or a vision board or whatever, or a happiness board, and you can write it in your notes and whatever. But for me, the, again, the luxury I have is I have a podcast and I have this audience on, on all these social platforms. So I get to get closer and closer and clearer and clearer on what my overall objective is. And if it, the, the real danger, and the danger I've seen in some of my friends, my really rich, when I've got a friend who's in Manchester, who's, Uh, a multi-billionaire. But the problem is he's never been clear on his North Star, his ultimate goal. So he's accumulated more and more and more wealth, but he's sacrificed all of these other things um, in the process. And he's now at a point where he doesn't even know what those other things are that would make him happy, but he's desperately in search of them. And, and I think that any journey you go on, you have to, you have to embark on the journey with the lights on. Or else, you know, and, that this, and when I say the lights on, it's just a real, real unwavering clarity as to why you're doing this. And that's what I didn't have when I was 18 years old. I, I didn't know why I wanted a Range Rover. I didn't know why I wanted to be a millionaire. Yeah. Uh, and, and so when I got there and I achieved all of those things, you, you look down at your hands and you have Range Rover keys in one hand and you have, you know, money in the other hand. And you think, why did I want this again? And, 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 and typically that's because people have taken their why, their purpose from external sources. So Instagram have told you you need a Range Rover or mm -hmm. magazines have told you you need a Range Rover or peer pressure or social conditioning. And then when you get it, you realize that it wasn't intrinsically for you and therefore it means really nothing, nothing at all. Um, so yeah, I think, I think to answer your question, and it's been a very long answer, but I I just I'm really... 
clear. I'm really, really clear on um, on what I want my life to be like. And so, prioritizing on a daily basis is fairly easy. And uh, yeah. And it's do easy. you actually journal, um, or actually do you make a plan every? I don't know, every single day, things you want to achieve um, or for the next week or for the next three months. I mean, there are many people, they recommend these long-term planning and strategies. Sometimes I have it in my mind, but I don't really write it down. I don't, so the, again, the, 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 with my finances, I plan my finances really well, but all these other things, I don't feel the need to write um, a journal because as I said, yeah. I have to write, I have to write at length every single day and my podcast comes out once a week and in order to do my podcast, I have to write 12 pages of wow. thoughts and, and then all my notes are full and I have to tweet and I have to write on Instagram every day. I'm basically like a publisher and what I'm publishing is the story of my life and my thoughts at, at all times. So if you're not doing that, if you're not in a situation where you have to post your ideas two times a day to the world and you have to record a podcast for an hour about your life once a week, then I would highly recommend i would insist that you do something like that that whether it's a blog or a journal that's private whatever it is or a youtube channel something that makes you think more about your thinking and thinks more about your, you know your direction and your why um and even things like this when i do things like this it kind of reaffirms and i do interviews again all the fucking time right i do interviews every single day of the week um it reaffirms in me what matters and what i'm doing and what i'm aiming at just by saying it out loud it's like therapy um Do more of that. Do more of that like self-therapy. All At the end of the day, it's thinking about your thinking. And um, do more of that. Do more of that. Yeah. One last advice you can maybe give us. How can we stop comparing ourselves with others, especially on social media? See, this is a very, it's a very hard thing because the brain uses comparison as a way um, to ascertain the value of something, right? So in a world where there's no iPhone, the Nokia phone, is a brilliant phone, right? And in a world without lightning fast 5G internet, the dial-up broadband router that I had in my house at 12 years old was just fascinating, the fact I could get on the internet. And like, in order to attribute value to anything in the world, you need to have, the brain needs a, something to compare it against. And this is why I say like, we used to think Nokia, the big old brick phones were amazing until we saw an iPhone. But in a world of iPhones, the Nokia looks like a piece of crap. And typically the brain has had to make these kind of like super fast um, decisions for you for survival reasons. So it's like there has to be a real big autopilot component of your brain, which attributes value to things. And we don't make logical decisions either. We don't make logical decisions as it relates to comparisons and value. Um, there's so many experiments and tests they've done about how the human brain works, where they'll put certain items on a menu in a restaurant and people, no matter what the items are, will always pick the second most expensive steak on average because they think the first one is too expensive, they think the third one is not good, so they go for the middle one. And it's the same with TVs in a shop. If they put three TVs in front of you, a really expensive one, a medium one, and a cheap one, people will typically um, go for the middle one because they've used the other two TVs as a way to judge the value of all of the TVs. And like, this is how we, we judge the value of things, but we do it for ourselves too. So in a world where everybody is, 20 you know 200 kilograms then um you know me at 150 kilograms i would be skinny and attractive and beautiful the world is operates in a subjective way so like how do you stop yourself um doing that from a mental perspective the truth is you can't but i think there's you can introduce a little bit of um a little bit more rational thinking into the mix and um you can work on building your self-esteem so that any comparison doesn't have a detrimental impact on your view of yourself. Like, do I think I'm the, the most attractive person in the world? No, I don't. Do I think I'm, I have the sexiest body in the world as it relates to the subjective you know, term, which we call sexiness? No, I don't. Do I care? It's probably a more important question. And that question, and for, in those cases, uh, my answer is no. Do I think I'm the most successful person in the world? No. Do I think I'm the most successful person for my age? No. Do I care? And again, that, that, question is probably the most important which is comparison comparison isn't a dangerous thing to do it's usually the conclusion of the comparison that's dangerous and the impact that has on you and your self-esteem so yeah. yeah we definitely have to work on our self-esteem <laughs> that's for sure yeah yeah um amazing so i have a little last game for us so i'm saying one word and you're going to reply with your opinion in just one sentence okay mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> It's actually a fun game because it's not really related to happiness, sexiness, or success. So I'm going to start sure. with the word Boris Johnson. I'd say unfit for the magnitude of the job. <laughs> All right. Corona. Beer. Favorite. I would say virus, but I just think there's so much negativity. So I was just thinking of the beer reminds me of like celebrating with friends. The virus reminds me of not so good times. So <laughs> that's think true. of the beer. <laughs> Love or money? Love. Most recommended book? Johanna Hari, Lost Connections. Perfect. And last but not least, what do you think people notice most about you? Uh, it depends. Online, I'd say my hat. <laughs> On, in real life, I'd probably say my presence, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Thinking of, yeah. Amazing. Thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. I <laughs> That's appreciate actually it. it. And um, do, I'm always asking my guests in the end of each session if there is one person you would recommend us to interview for the next episode from your circle of friends or, I don't know, people, mentors, you think they, they are a must. Is, it, is, this a, is this going to go out in Germany? No, that's international. Okay. Uh, but you said like the... I mean, the, yes, we are publishing in Austria, Germany, and Switzerland, but it doesn't, it, it's um, not a problem if they only speak English. We are all, all um, asking a lot of people from the US. Um, I'd say a guy called Daniel Murray, who is the founder of a company called Your Heights, which is a brain supplement company. Mm -hmm. So Daniel Murray, and he has a podcast called um, Secret Leaders. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so cool. much, Stephen. Thank right. you Thank so, you, so much.